I was born in Blue Island, Illinois, and part of my childhood was spent in just a few years in, in Roseland, then my father passes away, and then we move to Mexico for about a year and a half. We come back, and we, we start all over again. By then, I'm about five years old. You know, my older brother, he, he always brought in his drawings uh, from school high school, whatever, and he had one wall, two walls really, were his in the, in, in the room, we used to share the room, and one wall was mine, I mean, and he would hang up all of his artwork from high school, you know, the one point perspective and so on and so forth, all of these assignments, which I couldn't even come close to doing, but I had my own baby pictures on the other side, you know, hoping to someday catch up to him. And my mom, you know, and, you know, she used to do some serious needlework with all this intricate uh, symmetry, uh, symmetrical designs that it's like, wow. And she would always give me colors, crayons, watercolors, paper, coloring books. When my brother leaves, my older brother is now 21 years old, and he's uh, Vincent Mendoza. He's Drafted, to, he has to go serve his time in the United States Armed Forces during the Vietnam years, which he never made it to Vietnam. But on his way out, you know, he gives me these uh, this, this big box of uh, pastel, uh, beautiful uh, Rembrandt pastels, soft pastels. He goes. You know, I want to see something when, when I come back. And there was like, uh, there's almost like, what, 50 Rembrandt pastels on each level. And it was three levels. Oh, man. I was, was like a kid in the candy store. I, you know, I took them everywhere. I put them in my pockets. I would draw on the sidewalk. I didn't know just how, the value behind them. And then when my brother comes back from the service, he had been away like two years, and he came back with, you know, these huge ideas of paintings and uh, murals, and you know, and he, he had done his research on the muralists of Mexico, and uh, you know, he came back charged, you know, with this this new pride, this new identity as a Mexican muralist. And uh, obviously that charged me. And, uh, and then he was the one that would have the, com the work that was commissioned to him. And you know, he was, I was like, I would only tag along and help him mount, you know, prepare his walls or, you know, whatever it took. I would do all the boring stuff, help him set up scaffolds and everything. Uh, but I learned the ropes. I learned what, what, it, what it took to become a muralist. Also the, the time when he was uh, working on um, the mural at, uh, with Ray Patlan and uh, Jose Nario. They were working on the mural in Blue Island, Illinois. And all of a sudden, um, police officers came and they said they couldn't work on it no more because uh, they were in violation of some law that, you know, they needed a permit, uh, like as if they were painting um, a sign or something, a sign permit. 
and they, you know, they threatened to arrest them if they showed up the next day. And uh, I was there, and I saw Ray Patlan stood up to the plate, and you know, uh, very articulate. He just stood up to the plate, and I mean, here these guys were no longer these new arrivals, Mexicans that just arrived from Mexico. They couldn't speak English or or defend themselves. These guys were raised in the United States. They had served their time in, in the United States for the armed forces. And they were articulate. You know, they could speak. And it's like Ray Badlan tells them, you know, we're just exercising our First Amendment. We have a right to paint. That, you know, that's our, that's, you know, that's what we're about as Americans. And uh, then the police officer said, well, you, you better not be here tomorrow because we will arrest you. So it was a big challenge, man. Oh, man, it was, it got pretty. So Ray Patlan and my brother called the media and there they were. It was like a standoff and they couldn't arrest them. And, and it was beautiful. I mean, uh, when it was all over and there was a, uh, a big celebration. Chuy Negrete shows up with his sisters, and because uh, they lived down the block from me, that there was this big celebration. There was all these Mexican people right there. And you have to remember the bridge. I think it's the Western that goes 147th and Western. Up on top, there was all these people, all these uh, government people in in trench coats with cameras, photographs. It was weird. But uh, but I think that those were very Kodak moments, I would have to say, for me that, that uh, really got me charged up, you know, as far as finding my direction. I first met Francisco Mendoza in September 1975. I was 21 years old. He was 18 years old. I was a first year teacher at Bowen High School on the southeast side of Chicago. He was a senior in high school. And I had this, remember this, I had 34 kids in the class. And no one would cut. Day after day. I mean, I really enjoyed the kids, I enjoyed being with them, and I got to know Francisco. So even back then, he was large in life. He was always so funny, always had ideas, always was so creative. Uh, always a way of everybody liked him. I mean, if he had ran for class president, he would have won hands down. I mean, it's like, you know, how could you not, not like Francisco? I mean, he's this amazing, amazing person who uh, just has a way with human beings. Uh, I knew Francisco when we were in high school, and we didn't have a lot of classes together. We had a physical, uh, the gym, I guess it was, and we had swimming. And I couldn't swim, and I guess I don't know if he could swim, but we had this class together where we would swim. And that's where we got to meet each other, and we got to know each other pretty well. And, and basically, we got to talk and everything, and then he told me he was an artist, and, and I said, oh, really, that's really good. And he told me what kind of art work that he did. And I was interested in, at that time, some other things, and I said, oh, you know, if you, do you do paintings and things like that? And he tells me yes. And so I was into this Bruce Lee thing, because Bruce Lee was a big thing during the 70s. And I told him, I said, oh, would you be able to do me a Bruce Lee thing if I showed it to you? And he said, yeah, I could do that for you. And I said, I would appreciate it. And so I gave him a, a newspaper article that has to do with uh, Bruce Lee when his movie came out. I think it was The Chinese Connection. And it was a picture of uh, Bruce Lee, like, projected on the newspaper, like he's flying in the air, which is part of the movie. And so I gave it to Francisco, and he takes it home. And a few weeks later, he comes back and he brings it to school and he brings this, it's almost like a poster size. And it was a beautiful thing that I've seen because I've never had anybody do artwork for me. And I thought that was very interesting and I thought that was a beautiful job he did. I met Francisco at the School of the Art Institute. He had just returned from uh, being in Toledo, Spain. This must be 1983. It was my second year in the School of the Art Institute, yeah. Subsequently, we stayed in touch because the years that I work in the Mexican Museum, uh, we were in touch. I organized a, a solo exhibition of his at the Mexican Fine Arts Center Museum at the time uh, with his uh, acrylic paintings, mostly uh, acrylic paintings on paper. 
I first met uh, Francisco Mendoza at uh, a gallery called Inkworks. It uh, served as a gallery and a print shop as well. We printed for a lot of progressive causes. We helped Harold Washington get elected, uh, Luis Gutierrez, uh, Del Valle, uh, Danny Davis, and other interesting people. And uh, we had a gallery there that uh, was a springboard for the museum. They, they showed their first uh, shows there in order to get backing so they could open up by the park. And when Francisco came, he was a good friend of Totoleto's, who was his teacher. And we would speak about Pilsen, because he was really interested in Pilsen. And then of all things, I start the museum here in Pilsen. And next you know it, Francisco's following me and he's teaching at a Cooper school back then. And so I got to see Francisco a lot. So we would go eat a lot of shrimp, a lot of seafood, a lot of pizzas. You know, and so, so, so we became good friends. Then he worked on summer programs for us. He worked on the uh, Selton, the no, wait, the Mosaic Town project, and uh, 18 Street in the Out, that was our project with our kids. Uh, the Cooper School project, that's another project we worked with him as well. Uh, the same, what used to be St. Vitus Church, uh, the image of, of the Viewing Loop and the images there, that was another project we did. So we worked on a lot of projects. What I found was uh, in South Chicago, everybody wanted a mural painted by me, but everybody wanted it free. Whereas in Pilsen, it, I was compensated, you know, partially because I was a school teacher and that was part of my job. Uh, I, I would go that extra mile at, at, in Pilsen. Uh, the community was uh, a hundred times larger, a hundred times more active. Uh, South Chicago at that time was very dormant. I knew Francisco had come from the south side through Roman Villarreal and uh, his people. And uh, Francisco, I think, wanted to become part of Pilsen because he was down in South Chicago, which was kind of rough and tumble at the time. And uh, he wanted to teach in Pilsen. And he, I think he liked the community and the people that were here in Pilsen. So uh, when he first came, he was uh, very jovial. Uh, he's always telling jokes and he liked having a good time. And he would interact with a lot of the artists and we had a lot of uh, gallery openings and he took to certain people. I, I know that he and Sal Vega got along very well. And uh, two or three years later, they ended up getting a studio across the street from uh, what's now the jumping bean. Well, we've had a studio together uh, here on 18th Street. We've never really worked on a mural together. I wish we would have, or still can. Uh, Frank and I, I guess, go back when I first started at the Art Institute. I had met his brother, but then I, really, uh, I learned that he had a younger brother, Frank, and uh, this first time I ever went to South Chicago, being born and raised here in Chicago, uh, realized that there was a big Mexican community and uh, they were from South Chicago. And uh, Frank, Frank was still in high school when he was starting to do his, his art uh, thing and went to the Art Institute later on and that's where we, we hooked up uh, even more. Um, Realizing and recognizing that what we were doing or learning, uh, we identified uh, some sort of uh, the Mexican heritage, identity, and uh, we, uh, we, we somehow bonded. Once I started working at Orozco School, which was back then Peter Cooper Upper Cycle, and working with Dr. Micros at that time, the principal. Uh, I started doing my artwork, the, the paintings, the murals with the students, and that evolved into working outside. And, and, uh, and I was very fortunate that from day one, I had the, the support of the principal, the support of the Mexican Fine Arts Center Museum to paint, to work with mosaics, Venetian glass. And uh, which is very expensive, and uh, you know, Cynthia Weiss 
came over and she taught me and my students. She was paid through the Mexican Fine Arts Center Museum for giving us that brief introduction. And uh, we took flight with that. And I'm sure that in that first day, I thought I'd maybe stay an hour, and I think I spent the whole afternoon. He gave me a tour of his classrooms. He did his Columbo imitation. He told me stories, and just like his personality, it just exploded what he did with mosaics. Every time I came, we did a project together one summer. We worked a little bit on getting the first mosaic that went up on the old Orozco School. And when I'd come back a couple months later, I'd see that he'd done another 50 feet, and then another 100 feet. And just like uh, everything in his life that is just so enormous and kind of legendary, he took a small lesson and just put mosaics on everything that stood still in the, in the neighborhood. Just a beautiful, beautiful man and beautiful work. And now, the first time I met uh, Frank Mendoza was uh, when he was uh, teaching at the uh, what was then called Cooper Upper Grade Center. I was teaching at, at uh, the grade school, what they called Little, Little Cooper at the time, around the block. And a lot of kids that I had worked with would go uh, graduate school and they would go over to uh, the Upper Grade Center and, and they would come back and tell me all about this great teacher that they were working with and all this new stuff they were using and, and uh, so I wanted to meet this person. So when I first got to meet him, about the mid-80s, and I took to him right away. He was very personable. He had a great rapport with the kids and um, he's, he's influenced a lot of young people over the years. And a lot of people, they've gone on to be artists themselves and they cite him as one of the major influences in their life. And over the years I've, uh, that I've known him, uh, I would say he's even been an influence on my life as well. I've uh, borrowed some of his strategies in terms of working with young people. I only wanted to do the front facade of Orozco, which led to more things. It's like, uh, led to the uh, mosaic, the entrance to the uh, train station. It led to painting the whole train station. And then years later, in 98, it led to the design of the, the new auto school, which then, after that, it led to the, the big job in Texas. I think that the artwork has, has brought a lot of life to the community. Uh, it has a social and economic impact in the community. I mean, people come from outside. I see them in, in these big buses. They come out, they photograph, they get back in. They go to the museum, they go to the Mexican museum, they go to the, the other Oro school school. They, they photograph again, they, they go to the neighborhood restaurants. Um, so it, it takes on a life of its own. I'm very happy that the people here in Pilsen have uh, embraced me. Well, I met Francisco long time ago, about 25 years ago, in Pilsen, and he was working at uh, the work park, creating a mosaic mural with his students, and I was teaching ESL, and he would see me, and uh, I also told him that I was an artist. I would see him at different art openings, um, and then when I started uh, college and I wanted to become an art teacher, I did my student teaching at Orozco Academy. Mr. Mendoza has a, a flair and a style of teaching where he uses humor and he tells a lot of jokes um, and he, but at the same time through the, the humor and the jokes he gets the students relaxed and they actually create this beautiful artwork, whatever it may be for the day. First time I met Francisco must have been when we'd given him a teacher incentive grant to work on murals with his students at his school. We give the grants at a big event, and then I go out to visit. And I saw him working with his students at the old Cooper School, and I was very much impressed with the relationship he had with his students and the quality of work that uh, they were pursuing. He is a phenomenal artist. He's a very strong member of the community. 
uh, and he involves students very much in their work and gets them really involved in learning art and the art is involved in their own heritage, their own history. So it's Mexican art and it's uh, very meaningful for them and it's also meaningful for the neighborhood. And it's items that these students will be able to go by and see for many years to come. So I think he's just a phenomenal teacher, a great person, and uh, he was uh, you know, our winner of the year in 2003. And if you were to walk down the street with him at Pilsen, you know, nine out of ten people know him. And they honk the horn, or they're on a the bike, and they'll get off and they'll stop and greet him. And, and he gave a lot more than just teaching. Uh, the thing that was so special about certain teachers, you acknowledge them for who they are. And it goes beyond the, you know, nine to five, I taught you this and now it's over. He was teaching all the time, and, and they were always happy when they seen him. To know Francisco is to uh, be with a guy that is full of joy, full of energy, fun, entertaining, uh, and very giving uh, kind of person. I mean, you see that uh, with all the students that come around, the several generations that he has gone through at Orozco, uh, they always manage to come back and to stay in touch with him. Um, he has really touched a lot of a lot of lives, uh, young people, very talented, many of them, and uh, what he has given to the community through the murals, both in schools as well as the other projects that, that he has done, uh, like the one at the CTA L stop, uh, or the one in uh, St. Vitus uh, building as well. So uh, it is, I guess both as an artist and educator, but also the fact that he lives in the same community where his students are attending to school. It's, uh, it's uh, a double benefit for the community. Uh, that is, instead of having somebody that will be coming from outside, from another community, to teach in this neighborhood. He moved here, he lived here with his mother. Uh, this is his neighborhood, this is his life, his school where he's been teaching all these uh, many years. Uh, so it's uh, a one sort of double life with, with community and with his education and then his artistic component. Um, so I, it was an honor for me to work with Mr. Pino and Mr. Mendoza. And our friendship started growing from there. Uh, later on, I became one of his models, because I know he's had many models, but I was one of his models. And uh, he did this painting of me, and it's right here, and it's called La Paloma y el Jaguar. And uh, this is uh, the back side of me, and I'm the Paloma. And this figure here in the background is el Jaguar. Um, but he told me that the Jaguar is actually uh, my baby brother, who was a boxer and who was murdered in 1990 on the streets of Chicago. And uh, me and my brother had a, a very, um, we had a really good brother and sister relationship. So he says that the Hawar is my brother actually protecting me. And that's why he stands behind me and he's bigger than me. Um, and I really like this painting because, well, first of all, because I'm the model, but also because of the symbol, the symbolism behind it. And I actually have this dress that I bought in Mexico, in Oaxaca. And I have the jade necklace and the jade earrings. And um, I think he represented myself very good in this painting. I met Francisco at that press. I was working at that press. And he came in to do a postcard, a layout. And I was a person. And I did his layout for him. He invited me for a photo shoot so we could like get some art up for his galleries, which was really fun. We did the photo shoot in Pilsen at a cafe. I noticed that he has a, a very keen eye for detail in all of his artwork, especially with the female models. I noticed that in their hair, and their features, what they're wearing. Um, I think there's a, a, one of his friends, she plays the mandolin. Um, 
uh, another friend has a feather in her hair and it, it's, it's so beautiful the way he has all these details in the artwork. Um, but aside from him being an artist, he's also an awesome friend. But then also he became very interested in doing prints. So he had been working some little ones and then later some larger ones. And then he needed somebody to actually pull his prints because he never really got into the, the business of, of actually getting a, a press so that he can actually print. So I, uh, over the last probably five years or so, I have been uh, helping him uh, pull prints, uh, editions from his plates. I'm very honored to be his inspiration. And I know he says it a couple of times. And he's, he's always, he's always around. I mean, everywhere you go in person, you see his work. I didn't even know that the laundry he had done that, but like I had like a feeling that he had done that, but then um, I'm very blessed and fortunate to have met him. He, he says that I inspire him, but he's also inspired me. I feel like Muhammad Ali, when he, when he won the, the, the world championship title off of Sonny Liston, and he's in the middle of the ring and he's got the, he's got the belt up in his hands and he's doing the Ali shuffle. I've been training hard, I know who I'm fighting against, and I'm going to whoop them. See, I fought them all, I fought the Frasers, the Listers, the Fulmans, and now people say, how would have Mike Tyson would have fought me when I was Cassius Marcellus Clay in the 60s? There would have been no contest, because I would have been on my toes, and bobbing, weaving, slipping, sliding, throwing the left jab, the right cross, doing the rope and throw, looking so pretty. Floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee, I would have taken that jump by the common three. Thank you.